So good morning everybody and uh, welcome to Drupal South. Hope you're enjoying the conference so far. My name is Akhil Bandari and uh, I've worked for the Department of Communications and the Arts for the last seven years, mostly in the digital communications area with uh, projects migrating the external websites and our ministerial site. So today we'll be discussing the Have Your Say module that we built for GovCMS and our challenges in making the consultations available for everyone. So we're just going to be talking about our lessons learned and insights and how we tackled our main challenges in our agile journey in adapting um, the GovCMS and Drupal to our platforms and also building our consultation platform, have you say. Hopefully you'll be able to use some of our lessons learned in your own GovCMS projects. So about five years ago, we developed our new digital communication strategy, which recommended that we actually update our external departmental website. The site was about three years old at the time, and when it was launched, it had all the latest uh, design and technology built into it. But as we know, technology moves very quickly, and the design and content was due for an update. So additionally, the site ran on physical servers. So that was in the building, and we wanted to move to the cloud. This gave us an opportunity to completely refresh the site from scratch in line with our new digital communication strategy. Sorry, there's a delay on this when I press the button. <laughs> so the aim was to create a new user-centric site with an updated visual design and greatly simplified content information architecture. This was to better surface the user needs and find, to help them find what they were looking for rather than replicating the organizational structure on the site. And we were going to build a new consultation module as part of the new upgrade. So serendipitously, the Department of Finance had launched, was just about to launch the GovCMS platform at the end of 2014. This is going to be a whole government initiative for a content management system that would be open source on Drupal. This meant that certainly agencies could benefit from contributing to the development of the platform itself. This is going to be amazing. Now, we were going to also put our hands up to be one of the early adopters for the group. And this also, oops, sorry. Okay, we also decided to work with GovCMS to help shape and develop the platform. Okay, now I've found a slide here about uh, federal government departments and IT projects. Now, I caveat this, this is actually US information. It's very difficult to find Australian ones. But I'm going to zoom in a little bit just to give you an idea what it was like way back in 2014. So again, this is US data. So 2014, the adoption rate of agile in government, in federal government, was about 32. And a couple of years later, you can see here it's almost doubled from the year before. So just a quick poll within the room here. So who works in private sector? Hands up. Okay, and keep your hands up if you use Agile as well. So, if, yeah, yeah, okay. And who here works in government? Oh, quite a few. Okay, and who uses Agile or Agile-ish? So it's not too bad. So most of you who in government would actually be using Agile at the moment, which is quite good. So that kind of uh, lines up with the 80% that we have at the moment. So the next thing we did was we worked with a digital agency to develop our archetypes and personas, which would map out our user journeys for the site. We'd, this resulted in four archetypes, which are high-level user groups that would be used for the site. We had citizen, government, industry, and media. Now these four archetypes drove the entire visual design and layout of the website and content restructure. Okay, I'm just trying to catch up with my slides. Okay, now here's an example of the site design that we had, one of the earlier ones. And as you can see there, we've kind of split out the home page for the different audiences that we have. So you can see that this is for industry, uh, 
and we had different bits of information that was relevant to the actual audience. So government, they'd be interested in this section and this section here. The media, which are the journalists, would be around this information here, and obviously citizens here. So some of them would overlap, but generally we were able to try and capture as much of the different audiences and archetypes that we could get for our site. So next, we had to also engage our internal stakeholders, which either had done a consultation or were planning to do that. And we were able to map out the, uh, have you say, process internally. It narrowed down to two basic paths. And these were public consultations, so for anyone to be able to participate in at all, and private. And these were generally for, uh, for example, a select group of stakeholders, such as Telstra, Optus, or Vodafone only. So now we knew who we were going to actually, who was actually going to use the Have Your Say platform and how they were going to do it. So the next thing is we're now going to build our Have Your Say platform itself. Now, it was a steep learning curve moving, from, moving to Agile and moving from a paradigm shift of the Prince to project management framework that we had in place. We decided that if we were going to move to Agile, we'd all have to start learning to talk the same language. So our entire branch, was a, attended a full day Agile overview session with a trained Agile coach. We also need to bring, needed to bring another key stakeholder to the journey, which would be critical in the uh, success of any future projects, and that was going to be the executive. With the executive, we ran only a one-hour high-level overview session, and that was mainly to give them an understanding of the key differences between what they would do for traditional project management and uh, the expectations of Agile projects and also to understand key concepts like sprints, backlogs, and uh, retros, and also grooming, which had nothing to do with cats and dogs. Okay. It's just a very slow button here. Now, one of the early challenges that we had was with our internal IT management, and specifically around internal governance, reporting, and project funding itself. Now, these all followed a more traditional approach of having to get the funds ahead of time. So following the governance structure wasn't so bad, and so was following the reporting. But bidding for project funding was a lot more challenging. Now this may sound familiar to some of you, but with our traditional waterfall style projects, we detailed the business requirements and exact budgets for the entire development phase just in order to put a bid. Now you may find this fairly familiar, it is just project A, you need X dollars to give you exactly Y output. And that was an expectation that the project board and business had. What we found with Agile though, is that it was a little bit more fluid. We had to begin some kind of discovery process to even understand what we were trying to build and how we were actually going to build it. And that was going to inform a reasonable estimate for the build. So in the beginning we just put an amount and we thought we'd need, and basically that would be, if we went over that amount, we would be a typical waterfall project. If we came under that amount, we would then pr just pr produce more features and the project board itself would be quite excited about that. So in the beginning, we just were able to finish our site in six months and we were running in four week sprints. And our minimum viable product did include the Have Your Say module. We also determined a average cost for a two week sprint, which we then use for future sprints and for future projects. So after launch, we quickly m and smoothly moved into a continuous improvement development cycle. Now, we completed another six two-week sprints, and we were able to build a lot more of the features and enhancements that we intended to have for launch. Now, moving into continuous improvement cycle itself became very contentious at times. Our team wasn't big enough and didn't have dedicated developers to actually develop a lot of the work, so we relied on external developers to help us out. And in an environment of competing and limited resources, we had to justify the continuous improvements we were trying to achieve at each of the sprints we ran. We often were asked, do you really need this feature? You may have heard many of these questions. The site seems to be running okay, so why not work on something else? Or X project is more important right now, and we need the funds and resources for that. So, Here's my example for our have you say and the continuous uh, improvement that we had to do for this. 
So in 2014, we launched the site with the Have Say version 1.0. In August 15th, about almost a year later, we were able to do some work on the Have Say, but it was also added to the government, uh, GovCMS distribution. So it's available for anyone who is using GovCMS to actually install on their site. Is anyone by any chance using that at all? Nope, okay. And what we did then about a year later was uh, create some enhancements. And the first, oh, we wanted to do some enhancements. The first phase of that was to actually do some user research. So we were able to carry out the user research with a specialist um, vendor. And it worked out quite well because we actually had a technical architect on board as well who was able to then translate the user research findings into a backlog. So then at the end of the project of phase one, we had a backlog ready to go with all the um, detailed or high level details at least to be able to um, e work out an effort for the amount of work that it was going to take. And we had worked out it's about roughly two sprints. So as I mentioned earlier, we had already worked out how much a sprint would work. So now we had basically a project or a mini project ready to go when we were ready. But the thing was, we haven't had a chance since then to actually work on this. So there are too many other priorities and things that seem to come up and other resources that are competing for this. So finally, running a bit ahead of time, but this is our top ten, oh, top three tips, I should say. So one in, all in. Educate yourself and others as, as you're going along the Agile journey, especially at the beginning. There are many interpretations of what Agile is and how it is done, but it can be done well and it can be done pretty badly. Your best chance of getting it right is to first learn the Agile from a, uh, an Agile coach or someone who knows what they're talking about first. Then the Agile process is a journey within your organisation and you can't do it yourself and it can't be done overnight. You need to take baby steps and in most cases, in fact, you'll if you believe you're doing it right, right, you need the rest of the team and key stakeholders to work with you. Otherwise, it'll be a very lonely and futile journey. So the second one is, make traditional project approaches a work for you. Adapt Agile to work with internal project frameworks and processes that already exist. Now, I know this is going to go against some of the Agile purists here, but we and they may agree, disagree with me, but again, C.1. Um, if you can work towards a pure Agile, if you want, but it takes baby steps to get there. Agile can still work in parallel with traditional project frameworks, like PRINCE2, um, in some cases, but most of the projects, processes can exist pre and post the actual development. Then you can follow Agile phase for the development itself, and then eventually, hopefully, you can widely be adopted as approach for all of the projects within your, within your organization. Obviously, this depends on the appetite within your organization. So you don't want to be that guy or girl sitting in the corner with a tinfoil hat preaching agile manifesto to everyone in lunchroom. And the last one so far is continuous improvement is a marathon, not a sprint. Continuous improvement is, improvement is a very, it's a long game and once you start, it can be a slippery slope. But it can be done. But do you choose? Do you do a one-week sprint? Do you do two-week sprints? Or do you do single-day sprints? Um, how you approach is probably best suited to how your team is made up and what type of work you're trying to do. I suggest keeping a product backlog of user stories as you go along, even if you're not actively running in sprints. And then you can potentially use a Kanban-style approach where your team can just pick one or two of the top fully groomed user stories which are ready to be developed when you have a sprint ready even if that's just one developer working one day a week. Okay, so I have one bonus tip. Eventually. Okay, so have a good understanding of who your audience is and a clear direction of what you're trying to achieve. Now this helped us and it was a key role in helping us decide what features to choose and groom and also prioritize. And that way, with our limited resources, we were able to get the best bang for our buck as we were going along. Okay, so thank you for your time today. And <laughs> does anyone have any questions? I have the mic, so you have to.
times it hung from uh, not very comprehensive. Now, as a private vendor uh, trying to encourage government, government organisations to adopt pure agile contracts, <laughs> um, what is uh, a key thing that is, is possibly going to get these um, over the line? What, what are the key points that they're, they're worried about? So maybe, you know, cap budget, but there are the features. Yeah, pure agile is, is it's quite tricky, especially when you're working with projects. Um, obviously, with the traditional approach, you need to have everything kind of up front. So we would normally kind of estimate what the effort would be, but we'd speak to the vendor probably a little bit earlier um, than when everything was due. So we'd try and work out um, what the expectation was between the vendor and the uh, ourselves in this case, and what the expectation was about the budget in particular. It really works in what we what the effort the vendor can think they can get done for the particular budget. That is a good question, actually. I had a demo ready. <coughs> Just waiting for my computer. Yes. So one of the things we did is uh, build out the have you say is a fairly prominent item on the website. So at the very top there you can go to the have your say area and I might zoom out a little bit. If it'll work. Okay, so so some of the features we have on there we needed to allow people to understand what was going on for a particular have your say. So the things we need to know is uh, what or that what they needed to know was what information they needed. So we were able to break out the page and have the how it works section. So we were able to give people information about what they could do, uh, what they had to do to get their co actual consultation running. It's actually going to go into a consultation itself. So here's an example of a consultation we have at the moment. So there's information about what they need to do to actually participate in the consultation itself. Now, key information about the issue, including dates that it's open and closed, at the very top there. You were able to upload relevant documentation. And there are different variations of the participate section down here. Now, this particular one is under review, so there's an open section. I'll quickly show that. And it looks like this. So you have a kind of a counter to show how many days remaining that you can actually participate. Now, depending on the consultation, you can actually either participate fully, or in this case, I think it's in between rounds. So this particular one has several rounds. So although the consultation's open, I think they're, um, they're in between the submission rounds. So you can actually just have uh, a form in this case. I think the version one that's on the distro is just a form, um, which you fill in and it gets an email sent to you to notify you of uh, the submission sitting on the site. We've actually upgraded that since, and so now anyone who submits a form will actually have the um, consultation attached to the email itself, so you've got to manage that. What we haven't built yet is the submission management system. Um, that's one of the, the backlog items, is to actually connect that using Microsoft Dynamics and have a CRM connected to actually manage all the content man uh, all the submissions themselves. Uh, we also have some other features which haven't really been used yet, and that includes having short comments. So a social style, kind of asking a question and then allowing people to make short comments. Um, we can also surface social media. And I can give you a quick example on our home page, if I can find it. And you can, it, n the social media is a bit tricky because you need to have a hashtag because we're using filtered hashtags to be able to surface the relevant content. So there's an example of social media. So we can embed a similar kind of widget into the Have You Say consultation. Will you be migrating it to GovCMSA? <laughs> yes, good question. So uh, we migrated it recently from another platform onto D7. Um, the idea then is to uh, wait until D8 was launched, and which could be later this year for us, that will then move over to D8. 
Luckily for us, the, um, it kind of depends for the, m the modules that are available for D8. The site here um, is fairly complex and we needed to have the equivalent, we needed to have the equivalent, um, quiet. Uh, we needed to have the equivalent modules available to be able to migrate the entire site over. So um, we were one of the more complex sites with all the panels and views that we have. Um, so once the D8 uh, distribution has more of the modules, then yes, we'll probably be move it, moving over. Did you uh, have any MVP uh, while building this website? Any? Uh, MVP minimal product? Yes, we did. Um, Ah, very good, okay. Um, I think all the way back to 2014. We had started the project with wireframes, interactive specs, and quite a lot of detail. We wanted to go live by June, and we started the discovery phase for two weeks in December. So when we had the full backlog, we had to work out and um, estimate, sorry, I'm sounding weird because of the cable there. Um, we had to work out what we could actually get done by June. So most of what we had is, let me see if I can show you. So we were able to build most of this um, by the launch. So we have a panel with different icons and taxonomy. We have another promotional um, landing page. This landing page is built up of content across the site. So you publish once and then you can promote these things to a landing page. A lot of the stuff that came on after uh, was the social media integration. We had Twitter at one point. Um, and then some of the additional features in the Have Your Say, which was um, adding the emails, attachments, and things like that. So we did have um, a certain backlog we had to get done, and then some of the nice-to-haves with the features added afterwards. Excellent. Any more questions? Great. Okay. Well, thank you for your time today. See how we go, yeah. Is that one on or? Great, has everyone got their coffees and settled settled into the room? I think there needs to be a bit more coffee. <laughs> um, cool. Okay, so it's great to be here at Drupal South. We're really excited today um, to go through and present to you how we've used GovCMS to, uh, to fuel the content for the Asada uh, Clean Fair Sport app. Um, so, in order to take us through this, uh, we have Alexis from Asada with us today, um, and uh, myself, uh, project director at uh, EY, and also uh, Vishal down here, who was the lead technical developer on the project. Um, so Vishal is just going to be around for all the technical questions that we get hit with at the end of the presentation. So what we want to go through today, just a, a brief structure uh, so we know where we're at. Um, I'm going to get Lex to take us through Asada's needs, the real reasons behind um, developing an app in the first place. Uh, and then the challenges that we found as an agency when responding to this brief 
and the key user journeys that we needed to solve and work through to develop the application. Um, that provides a little bit of background, and then I'll jump into how and why we decided to use uh, the Asada GovCMS platform uh, and Drupal to, to fuel, the, uh, fuel the application. Uh, and then I'll hand back to Lex to, uh, to go through the impact that the application has had on the organisation and the types of feedback and, uh, and responses that they've been getting over the last ooh, eight, or, eight or nine months now. Um, and finally, I just want to leave you with a couple of key takeaways, things that we learnt when we were, uh, when we were putting this uh, application together. Um, so firstly, before we jump into that, I just want to get rid of uh, perhaps an elephant in the room. Uh, some people might have seen this listed as a presentation by Adelphi Digital uh, and then seeing Ernst & Young written all over our slides. So um, uh, we have recently been acquired by uh, Ernst & Young for our amazing talent. I'm looking at you, Vishal, um, to expand their, their digital capability across Australia. Um, so we're really, we're really excited. It gives us access to, uh, to some big end of town systems and, uh, and processes while retaining our, our agile approach to, uh, to development. Cool. Now that's out of the way. I'll uh, hand over to Lex to go through the next. Thanks, Nick. OK, so for Asada. Um, so I am, my current role is the Director of Education and Innovation and what that means is I have to make sure athletes all around Australia know what their anti-doping responsibilities, their rights and responsibilities are um, and to try to reduce doping and one part of that is inadvertent doping. So that's people accidentally testing positive when they had no intention to actually cheat. Um, so what we wanted to do was build an app that could give them the information that they needed to be able to stop or reduce that inadvertent doping. Unfortunately, I'm going to give you a little crash course in anti-doping rules. They're actually really complicated, but it's some important background so you know exactly what the app is trying to do. So the first thing is that athletes um, all around the world, they are solely responsible for everything that goes in their bodies, and they are ultimately held accountable for that. So what that means is they can't blame a doctor, they can't blame a coach, um, they can't blame a supplement, for example. And what we found in Australia is that... Um, <coughs> Uh, supplements, um, about 20% of them, so one in five, are contaminated with an ingredient that is banned in sport. So, and most importantly, it's not listed on the label. So there's absolutely nothing that athletes can really do if they're choosing to take supplements to make sure that that supplement is safe. Um, the other thing that you need to know is that there's high-risk supplements and low-risk supplements. The high-risk ones are very dodgy. They're pre-workouts, they're protein powders, that sort of thing. The low-risk ones have actually, the manufacturers take them and they send them off to a lab and they get them tested for banned ingredients. So they can't give 100%, but they can make sure that they are low risk. Um, so that's really important to know because that's what we had to get out to the athletes. Now the core problem that we had was that one athlete in Australia tests positive from a supplement every month. So that's 12 athletes a year approximately who are banned from playing any sport. So we had an athlete, for example, who had qualified for the Commonwealth Games, uh, was taking a protein powder, um, turns out that there was an ingredient in there that was banned in sport. She had taken it, it wasn't listed on the label, and she still got a ban. So she missed out on competing in the Commonwealth Games and had a nine-month ban from all sport. Really horrible and absolutely not the sort of people we want to be catching, you know? We, that's absolutely not what we're about. So we went out to a couple of companies, including Adelphi, and we said, hey, we want to build an app. And what we want this app to do is to get to all athletes, hopefully, in Australia, um, we want it to be an app because we know that they're already on their phones. Athletes are quite young, they live on them. Um, and we want to be seen as not the police. We're actually here trying to help people. Um, but the most important thing that we wanted to do was to reduce this accidental doping. So what did it need to do? We told Adelphi, we need a supplement checking tool. This is like the main thing that the app needs to achieve. You need to be able to check whether it's been tested or not, whether it's one of those low risk ones or high risk ones. And if it's not tested, then we need a tool that they can assess the risk and decide whether it's high risk or low risk. So essentially giving athletes so much more information than they've ever had available to them before. And then of course, we're needy, we're quite greedy. Um, so we said if we're building an app, we may as well do a whole bunch of other stuff as well. So why not have the way to report doping? So if you see something suspicious, why not have medication checking built in there? 
Um, why not have a way to give, give us feedback? If a tester, for example, does something weird or a bit odd, they can tell us. Um, and finally, we wanted it to be a personal new communication tool, basically. So um, what we want is so we can actually target people who are swimmers to give them very specific information, or we can target um, rugby league players to give them very specific information. Um, and also, what we get out of that is knowing how many swimmers are using it, how many rugby league players are using it. And then, as an education director, I can target my program around that. So essentially, it was a pretty big brief. Poor Nick might have been a little bit worried when we first went in there. Um, but that's what we were trying to do. And I think Nick will talk a bit more about the end result. Um, so yeah, when we got the uh, got the brief, um, just a, just a side note to the uh, proposal was due on the twenty second of December, the day before uh, Christmas leave, which is always fun. Um, we d we kind of identified three primary challenges. One was content authoring. How was this content going to get to the application? One was the time pressure around the app and the development time of the app. Uh, and one was what Lex was just uh, alluding to around personalization uh, in, in the application. Um, so firstly, like content authoring, Asada are the subject matter experts, but their, their time is really precious. They're out there doing training uh, all day, every day, and don't have a, a lot of time to be learning systems for content updates and, and different, uh, uh, different ways of inserting content. And there was quite a bit of content to, uh, to add up, uh, to add in. So the, the key types of content that we were dealing with, one was around notifications and sending, uh, uh, sending notifications to people with the app, and one was around the supplement list itself, which had a range of variations that we'll get into in a little bit. Time pressure. So I had a really bad day at work once. Uh, I went home to, to my wife and I was, I was having a bit of a rant and I was like, why does everything have to be under time pressure? And she, she looked at me in a very pensive way, just went, death. <laughs> which was extremely <laughs> profound and, and I think very true. But but for us, uh, death wasn't our problem, Barobi was our problem. The Commonwealth Games on the Gold Coast were coming. And what it meant, we kicked off on the 5th of Feb, which gave us 40 development days to, uh, to, to, get, this thing, uh, to get this thing out and uh, deploy to the app stores. And anyone who's, who's deployed to Apple knows it can be a little bit of a, a, bit of a challenge pushing that through, it can take a little bit of time. Um, and the other question, the other key challenge was around personalization. So, um, look, nobody wants to remember another password for an app that they maybe use, you know, once a month, twice a month um, to check the supplements that they're going to use. So, how do we make it personal without any way to, to necessarily identify a user? So before we, before we go into addressing those key challenges, I think we just need to take a look into what the, what the app does. So um, as Lex mentioned, as Lex mentioned, it's a bit of a, a one-stop shop to expose a range of services that, uh, that Asada provides. But the core ch user journeys that we wanted to tackle were around uh, the supplement checking. Um, so there were two primary use cases. Firstly, uh, I have a supplement in my hand. I don't know if it's safe or, or not. And one, I'm looking for a supplement to achieve a, a, specific, a specific end. So with those two user journeys, they can both go and search on the, on the uh, tested supplements list to see if something, uh, something appears. If it's on the list and they're found, that's great, it's all good to go, um, you, can, you can take the supplement without, without fear. If it's not on the list, then we bring in the risk assessment tool. Um, and uh, people go through a series of questions and end up with a risk profile that lets them know how safe or unsafe the, the supplement is based on a range of parameters. So this is what it, uh, this is what it looks like. Uh, people can search, uh, search by product, see the, uh, see the, see the list there and, and scroll through. Uh, and then when they select a given supplement, um, the tested supplements list shows them the, the, the details associated with it. And there's a bit of information uh, in there. So there's information around the, the testing body that uh, approved it, uh, the product variant, they come in a range of different, different flavours, uh, and batch numbers. Uh, so batch numbers are, are really important. You can buy the same, the same product, uh, but if, if that particular batch hasn't been tested, then, then the outcome can be, can be variable. 
The risk, uh, risk assessment tool takes a bit of a decision tree, uh, decision tree approach where athletes are asked a series of, of questions to determine the potential safety of the supplement. And this was used not only to just get to an end goal, but provide a little bit of education as we go along. So you can see here there's a, uh, a question about uh, the, the, purpose of the purpose of the supplement. And if I answer um, yes, this, this supplement uh, is for weight loss or muscle building, it says, hey, these supplements are the most high risk that they can be. So there's a little bit of education as we go through. And again, leading to that, uh, to that risk assessment at the end. But we haven't even talked about Drupal and GovCMS. There's a fair bit of background there, but, uh, but how do we achieve this in GovCMS? So GovCMS was instrumental in helping us solve our key three challenges, content authoring, time pressure, and app personalization. So firstly, content authoring. Asada had been using uh, GovCMS Drupal 7 for, for a number of years. The, the, the content management system was well bedded down within the organization. People knew how to, how to, use, it, uh, how to use it well. Um, and given the, given the amount of content that we needed to update, it made sense to work with the systems that they were, that they were used to. So if we talk about how that actually actually works. So there were three kind of, I guess, pillars of pushing content out to the app. Firstly, around structured data, where we had structured data uh, like the testing body or the supplement category or the brand of supplements. We could use Drupal taxonomies to, uh, to, to, push, that, um, uh, to push that data into a Drupal content type where the variable of the data could be added. So the, the variance of the supplements and the batch numbers and all that uh, unique information. This was then exposed using the Drupal services module, um, which, uh, which essentially uh, creates an API that can then be, uh, then could be consumed by, by other parties. The API leads to this wonderful, very intimidating to a project manager like me, uh, JSON feed that then Vishal looks at and goes, this is gonna be beautiful and turns it into a wonderful looking app. So in order to keep the information up to date and make sure that when athletes are, are searching for their supplements, it's the right list, we fetch the information based on uh, when, when a user loads, loads the list. So it's always going to be up to date for users. Tackling Borobi. So time pressure, GovCMS really helped us uh, meet this really tight deadline. Firstly, because GovCMS was a known quantity at Adelphi. We'd, we'd worked in it quite, uh, quite, quite frequently. I think we had the first uh, contract under the Drupal services panel and been, been building GovCMS sites. So uh, our guys knew all about it. They were all over it. Um, secondly, we already had a really good working relationship with the, uh, the GovCMS team. Um, so uh, even in the, the proposal stage, we were in touch with those guys going, hey, is this, is this something that's, that's going to be feasible? Uh, and again, like with the content update, um, Asada knew the CMS and could get that out quickly. Third challenge around app personalization. So the key principles, we wanted to avoid passwords, we wanted to protect user data, um, but GovCMS doesn't allow for information to be pushed out of it uh, and doesn't allow for personal information to be stored. Um, so how do we make the, the content personalised? Um, we wanted to personalise it around the notifications. So Asada wanted to send out a number of notifications but wanted to make sure that they were going to be relevant to, uh, to the people that they were sending it to. So we could create the notification content type and use our taxonomies and APIs to, to create that information. But there was a barrier between that and the application services, the Apple application services and the Google Play application services, which actually send out the notifications to the phone. Um, so we came up with a, a, a little bit of an out-of-the-box solution that uses AWS Lambda as an intermediary to pull that JSON feed and then push it to the uh, Apple and Android uh, Apple and Android services that then send that on to a user's device. And we managed to personalize this uh, through a number of app settings that subscribe to a given channel uh, and then messages are delivered 
given the uh, to the to the users that have subscribed to that specific channel. So um, uh, there's a, r a range of options, including uh, being a coach or at state or state or national level, uh, or in the uh, or in a particular sport. My two favourites, as you can see, are camp draft and curling. Um, <laughs> So that's pretty much about the app. Lex, you want to take us to like what this has done for the organisation? Sorry, uh, very quickly. I guess um, it's been huge. It's been really successful. Um, I guess when we first met with Adelphi, we were setting down the objectives and what you actually, how are you going to quantify um, things? And we set um, a thousand. Um, in three months. And I remember being terrified and being like, oh, don't you think that's a bit much? Like, you're setting ourselves up to fail a bit here. But since we've had 10,000 in about eight months, which is huge, um, we've had around 30,000 supplements being searched, which is amazing. So any athlete that's going out there and making an informed decision makes me happy. Um, and I guess some of the feedback, mostly sports just say it's a game changer. Um, my favourite one, of course, was from an athlete who, um, you know, might have low expectations of Asada, I guess, and maybe government in general. <laughs> and uh, it was surprisingly not crap. Um, so when I saw that, that made me really happy. Um, but, you know, it was launched at the Commonwealth Games. We had uh, the Minister come along and do a big launch. We had lots of Australian athletes involved. Um, the World Anti-Doping Agency got really excited. Um, and when I go around and I show other anti-doping agencies around the world, uh, they're all really enthusiastic and kind of want to take it on board as well. So we're super happy. Thanks, Nick. <laughs> so, yeah, look, I mean, uh, the, the, the key things that, um, that we learnt when, when undertaking this, uh, this project, look, the, the Digital Service Centre does it by default now, but to really think about those user and organisational needs uh, first and the technology second. Make the technology work for those, those, those needs. Um, secondly... I see a lot of thinking around GovCMS and, and thinking that it's, uh, it's easy to stand up, it's, it's quite a straightforward thing to do. But think not what GovCMS can do for you, but what you can do with GovCMS. And reach out and collaborate, because seriously, the, the team at GovCMS are, are awesome. That's all. Um, I know morning tea's on and you're keen to get to food. Um, so if there are any burning questions, we'll take them, but we might just mill around afterwards uh, to, to ask any questions as well. So did anybody have anything desperate that they wanted to ask in front of everyone? <laughs> <laughs>